Hello, I'm Neil King from the University of Washington's Institute for Protein Design, and I'm delighted to be here today to speak with you about computationally designing nanoparticle vaccines. So I'll start by stating the obvious. We're in the midst of a technology-driven revolution in vaccine design. Um, we are seeing this all around us. We are living this uh, with the new vaccines that have come out for SARS-CoV-2. And there are multiple uh, technical technological revolutions happening here. So one of the areas in which we're seeing a huge amount of technical innovation is in antigen engineering for conformational or physical stabilization. Prefusion RSVF is one of the now classic examples of this, but the, the 2P mutations that are in most of the COVID vaccines that are out there today are another example of how conformational stabilization can lead to improved vaccines. Obviously, mRNA vaccines are, are totally revolutionizing the way that we're approaching vaccine design, manufacturing, and distribution, and have been incredible in, as, as pandemic response vaccines against SARS-CoV-2. And then finally, I'll highlight germline targeting as, a, as an approach that's bringing an unbelievable amount of technology to bear on the problem of designing vaccines that elicit broadly neutralizing antibodies against difficult targets like HIV on the little so overall, it's an incredibly exciting time to be in the field. Another area where we're seeing a lot of innovation is in the design of nanoparticle or self-assembling vaccines. And for decades, it's been known that self-assembling or particulate immunogens enhance immune responses through multiple mechanisms. One of the classic mechanisms is through B cell receptor clustering on the B cell surface, which in comparison to soluble or monomeric antigen, drives improved signaling in the B cell, <clears throat> which leads to more potent humoral responses. But it's not just B cell receptor clustering, the interactions of particulate immunogens with the innate immune system and their trafficking in vivo uh, are also superior to monomeric or soluble antigens, and this leads to their enhanced uh, potency. So I'll be talking today about self-assembling protein vaccines, this is, of course, a clinically validated vaccine modality. HPV and HPV vaccines are both self-assembling proteins. These happen to be virus-like particles where the capsid protein from the virus uh, or the surface antigen from, from hepatitis B naturally self-assembles to form a particular immunogen. And these are some of the best subunit vaccines that we have. However, if your antigen doesn't naturally self-assemble, uh, for example, influenza hemagglutinin, then you need a heterologous self-assembling scaffold upon which to present your antigen. So this is beautiful work a few years ago now from the, the Vaccine Research Center at the NIH, showing that ferritin, a non-viral structural protein that forms a complex with octahedral symmetry, 24 subunits, can, can scaffold a complex antigen like influenza hemagglutinin. This is a trimeric viral glycoprotein, um, glycosylated, has disulfide bonds, and you can seamlessly integrate this complex antigen into your self-assembly platform via genetic fusion. And so what you get is a protein that comes out of cells that self-assembles now and presents multiple copies of the hemagglutin and ectodomain in its native trimeric form. One of the beautiful things about proteins is, is they form they, they fold to single low energy uh, native states. And this is true for uh, these self-assembling nanoparticle vaccines as well. And so every particle looks just like every other and you get very monodisperse uh, populations. The data on the right is just some, some uh, immunogenicity data showing by three different humoral measures that the nanoparticle vaccine in this case out significantly outperformed uh, current commercial vaccines at the time. So this work led, has led to a, a huge amount of uh, work exploring multivalent display of, of complex antigens on non-viral self-assembling proteins. However, this is, this is just a, a tiny sampling of that work. However, almost all of this work <clears throat> utilizes one of three uh, scaffolds ferritin, encapsulin, or lumosine synthase. So although you know, this has obviously been quite successful, there are cases where you know, one of these particles just won't work for you, or perhaps is not optimal for generating the immune response that you would like. 
And so in those cases, you're kind of stuck because for example, ferritin is always ferritin. Uh, you can't change its fundamental structural properties. And so one of the things we're doing at the Institute for Protein Design is trying to um, design new protein-based technologies that are simple, robust, and controllable. And so we focus on generating new computational design methods that allow us to build these types of technologies. And this is how human beings traditionally have developed new technologies. This is a cartoon that just depicts if you want to make a new technology, let's say an alarm clock, and you limit yourself to only using available parts, things that are around your house, you end up with these ridiculous non-robust contraptions. But again, this isn't what we do as humans. We build the parts for the things that we need. And when we do that, we end up with technologies that are simple, robust, and controllable. And this is kind of what we're trying to do uh, with protein design. And so during my postdoc a few years ago now, we, we developed a general computational method for designing new self-assembling proteins uh, with atomic level accuracy. And this is a graphical depiction of that design method. So if we just focus on the top row, what we do is we pick a mathematical symmetry group. This happens to be icosahedral point group symmetry, which has five-fold and three-fold rotational symmetry axes. We then go find, or these days de novo design, building blocks, oligomeric building blocks, that match those symmetry elements. So in this case, a gray pentamer and a blue trimer. We then dock those building blocks in the target symmetry and sample the rigid body degrees of freedom in the system, which are very few, in order to identify docked configurations that look like they might uh, support interface design. And this is the second step of our protocol where we go in and we use Rosetta's sequence design capabilities to make up an, a new amino acid sequence at this interface between the blue and the gray protein. And if we get it right, <clears throat> then this, this designed interface should drive assembly to a single native state, which is that target icosahedral assembly. So what you get at the end of the, the day out of the computer is a hypothesis in two parts, a pair of amino acid sequences and a three-dimensional structure that those amino acid sequences should form. So in work published a few years ago by a very talented student, gra graduate student, Jacob Bale, that I worked closely with, we designed a, a series of icosahedral uh, nanoparticles from two different proteins in each case. So these materials have 120 subunits. They're a couple megadaltons of molecular weight, the size of the smallest viruses like AAV. And you can see from the electron micrographs that they tend to form very monodispersed materials. And when you compare averages from these micrographs, to projections calculated from the computational design models, you can see that they are designed quite accurately. When we go get crystal structures of these materials and compare them on an atom by atom basis to what we made up in the computer, we find that that accuracy usually is about an angstrom or less. In both of these cases, the RMSD between the two is 0.6 angstrom. So the, these materials were designed with atomic level accuracy. So we can predictively put every atom in these materials right where we think it should go. The implication, of course, is, is that this method now allows you to generate new nanomaterials with customized structures. So for example, if you wanted a structure with uh, a more porous structure, you might go for this architecture on the left. If you wanted a less porous structure, you might go for the architecture on the right. If you want a 16 nanometer, 17 nanometer, 18 nanometer nanoparticle, you can design that. And so we're using these as scaffolds for making new nanoparticle vaccines using an approach very similar to the work from the VRC and others that I showed earlier. What we do is we genetically fuse an antigen of interest, in this case, the antigen is blue, to one or both of our nanoparticle subunits. In this case, we fuse the blue trimer to a gray trimeric nanoparticle subunit that we've designed to assemble with this orange pentamer to form this icosahedral structure displaying 20 copies of this trimeric antigen. So one of the advantages to this system and, and, and these two component nanoparticles in particular is that when you manufacture the, these immunogens, you're just making two standard recombinant protein biologics. You make a trimeric protein, you make a pentameric protein, nothing special. Uh, and then you assemble these in vitro and you have control over the, the assembly process and they just spontaneously assemble to form this target architecture. So we've been doing a lot of this over the last few years with a huge number of collaborators all across the world, displaying a number of different antigens on these particles. And we've really convinced ourselves 
that these computationally designed nanoparticles are a robust and versatile platform for multivalent display. So today I wanna to focus on just two stories um, that highlight these, these nanoparticles. One of them is an ultrapotent nanoparticle vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, uh, in which dis multivalent display really improved immunogenicity. This is a close collaboration with the, the lab of, of David Wiesler here in the biochemistry department at UW and several other groups. And a second story on influenza where this story is really more about epitope focusing and improved breadth through multivalent display. And this is a close collaboration with Masaru Kanekio and Barney Graham at the NIH, as well as David Beesler's group. So starting with SARS-CoV-2, of course, last year when the, when the pandemic broke out, we wanted to see if our technology could help fight it. Fight it. Um, and so Lexi Wall is a very talented research scientist in the Beesler group and Brooke Viola, a talented research scientist in, in IPD's nanoparticle core teamed up to generate this nanoparticle displaying 60 copies of the SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain. So we displayed the spike as well, but we actually got better results just from displaying the RBD and the particle was much easier to manufacture and much more stable. So we went forward with a genetic fusion of the RBD to this trimeric nanoparticle component. And again, this orange pentameric component that we just make in E. coli two standard recombinant biologics that we assemble in vitro to generate the nanoparticle displaying 60 copies of the receptor binding domain. These particles, again, are very monodispersed. This is light scattering data showing sharp peaks at the expected uh, hydrodynamic diameter, as well as electron micrograph showing very monodispersed particles. These particles, as I mentioned, were, were very high yielding. Um, the proteins express very well and they're physically and antigenically quite stable. So here I'm comparing the monomeric RBD, the S2P trimer, um, and then one of the uh, nanoparticle immunogens. We tried a few different linkers. This one happens to have a 12 residue linker between the antigen and the particle. And using a, a standardized quality control suite that we now use for all of our nanoparticle immunogens, we showed that over 28 days, um, at room temperature, we saw no degradation of any of the physical or antigenic properties of the particles relative to particles stored at minus 80. And the, the electron micrograph of the particles at room temp for a month show you that, that they are indistinguishable. We found that the, the RBD as a monomer was very poorly immunogenic on its own, even when adjuvanted with, with Ativax. Um, the S2P trimer ectodomain was more immunogenic. So at low dose, we saw very basically undetectable neutralization after two immunizations. But at high dose, we saw neutralization that was at the upper end of a panel of 42 human convalescent serum samples that we had, which is in line with what others have seen for the, the S2P trimer. However, we found that the, the nanoparticle displaying the RBD elicited much higher levels of neutralizing antibodies, higher than, than the S2P trimer or our panel of convalescent serum. And Ralph Barrick and, and Alex Schaefer and his group um, challenged the mice that we immunized with their, their mouse adapted SARS-CoV-2. And we, we saw a similar trend where the monomeric RBD provided no protection against viral replication in the lung, whereas the S2P trimer uh, provided full protection at high dose, but we did see breakthrough at, at the low dose, whereas the, the RBD nanoparticle provided complete protection of both high dose and low dose. So one potential uh, concern about an RBD-based vaccine is, is you might wonder whether you're hitting just one neutralizing epitope or multiple neutralizing epitopes. The latter would obviously be preferable to minimize the occurrence of viral escape mutations. And so Lexi developed a, a competition uh, BLI assay and showed that in uh, NHP sera that had received the RBD nanoparticle vaccine, we see potent competition against multiple uh, distinct neutralizing epitopes. So the, the receptor binding motif that binds ACE2, as well as epitopes targeted by two uh, monoclonal antibodies. So the RBD-based vaccine is, is eliciting uh, neutralizing anti antibodies against multiple non-overlapping epitopes. And then uh, Bali Palindran and his, his talented postdoc, Prabhu Aruna Chalam, uh, evaluated the RBD nanoparticle vaccine in non-human primates 
using a series of, of clinically relevant adjuvants. And we saw roughly the same results. So in NHPs, we saw very potent neutralizing activity in the serum of immunized animals. Um, ASO3 in particular looked like it was a particularly good adjuvant uh, with this particle. And so <clears throat> that particle has now moved into clinical trials at two different groups. So our spin out company, Icosavax, um, has a phase one ongoing in Australia using MF59 as an adjuvant from Skyrus. And then SK has the vaccine in phase three um, using ASO3 from GSK. So the, these trials are the first uh, two clinical trials of our computationally designed nanoparticle platform. And we will see what the clinical data look like. But we're hoping that this vaccine can come in time to help uh, immunize the many people across the world that still need SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Okay, so pivoting to influenza, um, here we're, we're really going to be talking more about breadth and, and multivalent display of several related antigens on the same nanoparticle. This is an approach that, that Masaru Kanekiu and Barney Graham pioneered at the BRC and published in 2019, an approach called mosaic nanoparticle display. So the idea here is that instead of making nanoparticles that display multiple copies of a single antigen, you make nanoparticles that co-display multiple related but antigenically distinct antigens on the same nanoparticle surface. And that by doing so, you might preferentially activate cross-reactive B cells targeting conserved epitopes in this mosaic antigen array. To do this, they used ferritin, which is a, a nanoparticle that they had a lot of experience with, and genetically fused just the receptor binding domain of influenza hemagglutinin to ferritin. And by making multiple constructs with multiple different RBDs <clears throat> and co-transfecting them into eukaryotic cells, they were able to make nanoparticles that indeed co-displayed multiple different RBDs in this schematic, the NC99 and, and Calo9 RBDs, on ferritin. They showed, this is just one bit of data, but there's, there's a lot of data in this paper showing that the mosaic nanoparticle immunogens did elicit greater breadth within H1N1. All of the RBDs here were, were from H1N1 viruses, but the mosaic nanoparticles elicited greater breadth than an admixture or cocktail of nanoparticles, each displaying a single RBD or heterologous prime boost uh, with a series of nanoparticle immunogens. And so this was really the first data showing that mosaic nanoparticle display may improve the breadth of vaccine elicited antibody responses. However, using ferritin, they were unable to, to generate particles displaying trimeric hemagglutinin and ectodomains. And so they came to us and said, hey, can, can we collaborate to use this two component nanoparticle technology to make mosaics co-displaying oligomeric antigens. And so this was work led in my group by, by Dan Ellis, an extremely talented graduate student. And we made uh, multiple trimeric proteins here, genetic fusions between uh, trimeric hemagglutin and ectodomains that are in current commercial flu vaccines. So an H1 and H3 B Yamagata B Victoria to a trimeric nanoparticle protein called I53 DN5B. When we assemble each of these four individually with I53 DN5A, the pentamer, you can get different particles displaying each of these ectodomains. But if you mix the trimers together prior to adding the pentamer, then you get assembly of this mosaic nanoparticle immunogen co-displaying all four hemagglutins on the same particle. All of these particles look indistinguishable by electron microscopy. Um, very monodisperse. David Wiesler's group obtained a single particle reconstruction by cryo-EM showing that the icosahedral core is highly ordered. The antigen is displayed just a little bit flexibly, which is what we tend to see. But by doing a localized reconstruction, they were able to get a structure of the displayed hemagglutinin to 3.3 angstroms, showing that it retains its native structure. And then Dan developed an IP-based method for showing that in the mosaic, you can pull down all of the different hemagglutinins just using an anti-H1 antibody, whereas in the case of the cocktail, you only pull down the H1 particle 
and all of the other hemagglutinins remain in solution, demonstrating that we are in fact getting co-display on the mosaic particles. So the VRC and, and Sehan Boya Glubarnum led a series of immunization studies to evaluate these particles. And what we found in three different animal models, mice, ferrets, and non-human primates, was that the, these nanoparticle immunogens, both the cocktail in blue and the mosaic in pink, elicit vaccine-matched responses that are roughly equivalent to current commercial vaccines. So this is HAI, and you can see that against all four components of the vaccine, we're getting you know, equivalent or perhaps slightly superior responses to current commercial vaccines. However, what we saw was that when we look at, at responses against mismatched vaccines, oh dear, my apologies, responses against mismatched vaccines, so this is a panel of historical H3N2 viruses going back to 1993, both nanoparticle immunogens significantly outperform current commercial vaccines all the way back to 2003. So this is an experiment run back in time, but, but we're using it as a mimic of what might happen moving forward in time as, as you continue to accumulate antigenic drift in H3N2 viruses. And so we're hoping that maybe this vaccine could provide protection across multiple influenza seasons. What we saw here in, in micronutrialization is borne out in, in challenge studies where we found that, uh, that, that mismatched H3N2 challenge um, was really hard on current commercial vaccines. They did not provide great protection whereas the nanoparticle vaccine with adjuvant provided complete protection and unadjuvanted provided moderate protection that seemed to really correlate with the levels of, of neutralization. So when we went further afield and looked at heterosubtypic challenge, this effect was even more clear. We were getting a significant improvement in antibody responses in mice, ferrets, and non-human primates relative to current commercial vaccines, which performed very poorly against heterosubtypic antigens and viruses. So in challenge studies uh, with H5N1, H7, N9 viruses, we saw very poor protection from current commercial vaccines and robust protection from both nanoparticle vaccines. If you look across all, all of the challenge data, you can see that there seems to be a subtle yet consistent superiority to the mosaic nanoparticle relative to the cocktail. Passive transfer studies in NHPs, um, or sorry, in mice, in which we transferred antibodies from NHPs into mice and then challenged them, showed that the protection is antibody mediated. We wanted to understand this heterosubtypic protection a little bit more. And so Dan went back and made a version of these immunogens in which he reverted the computationally designed nanoparticle interface that drives assembly to the original residues there. And so these proteins cannot assemble to form the nanoparticle structure, but everything else is identical. And th this is the group shown in pale yellow. And what we found was that vaccine matched responses tended to be unchanged. It's about the same as commercial vaccines, but those heterosubtypic responses that we had seen from the, the nanoparticle immunogens were now completely knocked back down to the level of seasonal influenza vaccines. So the, the heterosubtypic responses we're seeing are directly linked to the formation of the nanoparticle structure. And we, of course, hypothesized that these might be stem-directed responses, and this was borne out in, in studies measuring uh, antibody titers against stem-only immunogens, H1 and H3 stem antigens from the VRC. And David Wiesler's group did polyclonal EM to directly visualize the, the polyclonal antibody response against both a vaccine-matched hemagglutinin, as well as a heterosubtypic hemagglutinin. In the case of the vaccine match, we saw that most of the antibodies were directed at the head. You get a few antibodies against the stem, whereas only stem-directed antibodies were observed against the heterosubtypic HA, which of course makes sense. And so the protection that we're seeing here, the heterosubtypic protection derives from these vaccine-elicited stem-directed antibodies one class of which, one very common class of which, remember that this is a polyclonal sample, uh, seems to re resemble the human BNAB, Medi 8852. So this vaccine um, is now in phase one clinical trials. This was manufactured by the NIH uh, and entered a phase one at the end of May. And so we're really excited to see how this vaccine performs in humans in the face of pre-existing immunity 
against influenza virus, which of course the data I showed you uh, did not have. That was all in naive animal models. So in just one last minute, I, I wanna show you that, you know, the nanoparticles that we have currently are only the very beginning. What we're doing now is moving beyond strict symmetry uh, to design a next generation of nanoparticles. And this project is a project, a team effort from Aliona, Andrew and John and my group to use, understand and use flexibility as a design element. And so one of our previously designed nanoparticles, I3210 was supposed to form a structure of about 29 nanometers. But when we made this thing, we saw particles, but they were too big. They, they didn't look like they formed the right structure. And this was the first time that we had ever seen an off target structure. We hypothesized that this might be due to flexibility of this globular domain in the trimeric subunit relative to its central coiled coil. Maybe this thing can flex and that's why you get a larger structure. And so we teamed up with the Wiesler lab to do single particle reconstructions by cryo-EM. And sure enough, you can see the, the icosahedral structure in there that was designed. So the target structure is there and that's a particle that looks like this, but right next door, you can see this much larger particle. And Andrew went, went back and, and eventually got six reconstructions of six different species in this sample, forming a variety of different structures that kind of resemble those formed by clathrin triskelions, which, uh, which have a similar, similar principle, a, a trimeric structure with flexible arms. And so we think structures of this type could form the basis of adaptable containers, reaction chambers, or scaffolds. And so one of the things we've been doing lately is going back and doing this prospectively rather than retrospectively. And so we're using underpacked building blocks. So proteins that we've made up in the computer to have local structural uh, deficiencies or instabilities. And we found that indeed these structures do form novel architectures that can only derive from flexibility. I'll have to skip the last slide, I'll stop there. Um, hopefully uh, I've convinced you that computationally designed nanoparticles can be effective vaccines, uh, effective, effective scaffolds for vaccines and that these two component nanoparticles give you uh, abilities like the ability to co-display oligomeric antigens that are difficult to get using other technologies. So I'd like to thank, of course, the people in, in, in my group and our collaborators groups that have done this work. I tried to highlight them as we went through. And then, of course, our funders, um, notably OpenPhil, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Audacious Project for the work that I showed today. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to the, the discussion section.